number seven beauty companies releasing a report called beautifully informed which delves into the here and now of beauty and looks into the future trends and market drivers we've brought together a great lineup of women who have come together virtually of course to talk more broadly about some of these themes in the beauty industry what's driving it how it's responded to COVID-19, what trends we expect to see in the future. And I'm thrilled to introduce to you our panel lineup. We have Anisha Raghavan, who is the Chief Marketing Officer in the US. And we have Grace Vernon, Global Trends Manager at Number 7 Beauty Company, who is an expert in insights, trends, and consumer beauty buying behavior. We have Millie Kendall, MBE, Chief Exec of the British Beauty Council, here to share her expertise and thoughts on how the beauty is showing up and changing. And we have the wonderful Julie Wilson, Beauty Director of Cosmopolitan in the US and an amazing woman in the beauty industry, who is a huge advocate and campaigner for women of colour. Thank you, Ate. I was so thrilled to be with this powerhouse group of women, each of whom are experts in the beauty industry. And to be perfectly transparent, we filmed this a few days ago, and the conversation was so amazing, we went on for 45 minutes. So today we're going to share an edited version with you, but we will have the full version available after the event if you want to check it out, as these women had truly fascinating perspectives on the beauty industry. So Julie, Grace, and Millie, thank you very much for joining me today. And if it's okay with you, let's jump right in. I'd like to start with a big question and get each one of your perspectives on it. There were a couple of areas of the Beauty Informed report that really intrigued me. And one was around how beauty brands are increasingly challenging the notion of antiquated beauty norms and what constitutes beauty. And the second is how companies are using the power of their brands to tackle issues that are important to their customers. So for example, improving sustainability, or providing support for issues, societal issues that are weighing down their customers. And so COVID is a prime example of this, where beauty brands have stepped up to support women who have been hit hard by the pandemic. So Millie, I wondered if I could start with you. And if you can tell us about your perspective on how the beauty industry has responded to the pandemic in the UK. I mean, I, th I think that pre-COVID, um, there were some challenges facing the industry. I feel like COVID just has has, um, has sort of set them to fast forward because they've become so much more relevant and pertinent to us. I think there's there's tends to be a bit of a difference between what we know as an industry, our challenges that we face, and what the consumer sees. So I think there's a little bit of a difference between perception and reality. And I think that what's happened during COVID is the perception has become the reality. So those two things have kind of fused together. Um, and I think that um, there have been a number of challenges the past 12 months. Um, you know, we've, we've, had, we've had time to look at how sustainable we are. We understand that we as businesses in the beauty or personal care um, sphere have to have purpose. Um, we're fully aware of people's mental health challenges, including our own, you know, issues with being locked up for 12 months. Um, BLM played a huge, huge part um, in forming our perception and our output um, and how we relate to people. Um, so I, I think so much has happened in the past 12 months that, that, that was bubbling under the surface and it's just come to the front you know this is this is time to act and i think that brands have realized now that this isn't marketing speak this is reality this is what the consumer wants and this is what we need to do to um to be relevant in the future yeah i agree with that <laughs> julie what have you seen on these issues as they relate to beauty brands what are you seeing in the u.s I mean, I completely agree um, as a, you know, I'm on the storytelling side of it. I'm an editorial, I'm a, a director, so I'm all about telling the stories of beauty brands and, um, you know, presenting products to our readers and um, our followers. So for me, it 
it is about that storytelling. It is about being authentic. It is about brands um, showing up in um, genuine ways. And, you know, COVID has, you know, done that magnificently in a way um, where companies have had to step up and make sure that their, their, um, their brand ethos and their brand storytelling is on point. Now we're in a place too where we have to make sure that that's not performative, right? Because so people are also looking to see like, are you just making these changes or are you just tell having these type of storytelling angles because you want to be relevant, because Black Lives Matter, because that sort of thing. And you want to make sure you're not a part of this cancel culture. So, um, it's it's been really interesting um, to Millie's point that you know I think that the industry for a while now has been trying to figure out that authenticity and trying to be more relatable to their consumer and now it's just hyperspeed now it's like you don't have time to figure it out like you got to be it and if you aren't it people are going to see that so um, and then that obviously makes my job a lot easier too in a sense of like. I want brands to give us a story that is exciting and thoughtful to tell to our readers because they're looking for that now. They're not just looking for like, oh, that's a great mascara. They're like, well, who's behind the company and like who's running and who developed that mascara? And like, sure, it's going to make my eyelashes look good, but you know, what does it mean in the grand scheme of things? Um, it's, it's that intersection between beauty and wellness and self-care and and being a good person rather than it just being this this aspect of vanity. Yeah, absolutely agree. I mean, we've seen brands get accused of that performative sort of action and others that take a really genuine approach um, and a sustained approach. So to your point, just be it. I like that. Um, Grace, can you talk about what you've seen from the consumer work you've done? Yeah, sure. I think, you know, just echo, you know, what both ladies have said already was consumers want brands to do more than just sell them stuff. You know, we're kind of over that side. We're over kind of consumerism. We want purpose. And we want purpose built and purpose driven brands. And I think, you know, just looking at the past year alone, we've seen, you know, BLM, the election, Brexit, mental health epidemic, and then COVID on top of all of it. And brands have had to respond to this in a way of, you know, we're going to help you get through all of this and we're going to drive change and we're going to make a difference. So, you know, right at the start of the pandemic, we saw companies shifting their manufacturing to create hand sanitizer. We've seen, you know, the number seven campaign to help women get back into work. And that's what matters. And they're the companies that will be remembered, the ones that really stood up and really said, you know, we're going to make a difference. We're going to support you. We're going to help you. And I think that's an interesting piece around, you know, as Julia said, around mental health and that a big epidemic that's only being kind of um, exasperated with COVID. And I think that's what we're going to see even more of. Um, and I think another interesting space that really kind of taps into all of this is around like the definition of beauty and how companies are challenging themselves to say, what does that even mean anymore? So, you know, I know Unilever recently said we're going through normal from all of our products because who says that that is normal? Who says that that is normal skin? Um, and I think that's something that we're just going to continue to keep seeing. And it shouldn't be the consumer that's pushing a brand to do that. Actually, the brand that's saying to the consumer, we shouldn't define to you what normal means or, you know, how you should define yourself as beautiful. And I think that's what consumers are looking for so much more now. Um, in everything from, you know, beauty to sustainability. We don't want to, you know, do in this call out culture call you out on social media for you to then make a difference we expect you to be the ones to call yourselves out on it and be willing to make that difference and then tell us that you've done it and um, so i think that's you know a big thing we're going to see, keep seeing going forward and i think you know when we look at the facts behind that so 81 percent of global respondents in a nielsen study then they feel strongly that uh, that companies should help to improve the environment so they're not just telling us to you know, recycle or, you know, stop waste. They're saying we expect you to improve it. So I think when you just think about expectations of consumers, they're just increasing all the time. And I think as brands, we just need to keep on top of that and keep challenging ourselves and not waiting for the consumer to provide the challenge for us to then respond to it. 
Thank you, everyone. So I want to talk about the impact that COVID-19 has had on the beauty industry and specific findings that the report had around things like skin, skin care sales have seen a surge in both the U.S. and the U.K. We've also seen significant growth in the bath category. And we've also seen evidence that um, there has been evergreen ingredients and in products such as serums that are having a real resurgence. And so, ladies, I'd love to hear your views on this. And Julie, let's start with you. What changes have you seen with your readers in their beauty habits? And is there anything in particular that sticks out to you? I mean, look, the the research is spot on and it makes sense if, you know, if if we would have predicted this crazy past year, um, I think all of us would have predicted that that's where the business would have gone. Um, we're in we're in our homes. Um, I think we're we have a lot more time and um, energy to focus on things like our skin that maybe we were neglecting beforehand. You know, a lot of people hadn't seen their baths in a long time. It was like shower, get out of the house, go to dinner, pick up the kit, do all of the things. So like the fact that you can just sit down and soak, um, you know, makes sense as well. Um, it also circles back to the mental health aspect of things, slowing down, you know, that two-step skincare regimen turning into maybe a six-step you know, skin regimen is, you know, not only caring for your skin, something that we're, you know, focused on and you want to make sure it looks good, but also it's self-care, right? And then, you know, going into the bath. We also saw a lot, um, our readers at Cosmopolitan were very hyper-focused on hair removal. You know, there was no going to get waxed and, and that sort of thing anymore. So it was like, how do I remove this unwanted hair? Um, also the hair on top of your head, like how do I, you know, cut it? How do I dye it? Am I going to give myself bangs because I'm losing it and I just want something different? So, um, you know, we've had really interesting time kind of figuring out how we're feeling and how our consumer is feeling and um, telling stories in a way that feels relevant, obviously, but also has some levity, right? It can't just all be Debbie Downer. We want to make sure that we're also bringing joy into our lives. And, you know, beauty is an amazing vehicle of that. I'm so glad I'm a beauty director because during this time, like, I would hate to just be writing about the doom and gloom of, you know, the, the state of the world, whereas I can write about beauty in a way that feels like I'm talking to you during this time of a pandemic, but in a way that is going to help you, you know, flourish or feel better about the situation or just kind of escape. Beauty is a great escape um, from what's going in, going on in the outside world. So I think it's a combination of obviously skincare and bath products and, 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 you know, and hair removal and all of those things that are happening, but also telling those, those stories in a way that is um, uplifting, um, that I think is really important to us because it, it's, it's part of our responsibility to make sure that they're okay as well. Grace, can you tell us more about any research or trends you've seen on skincare behavior and the report also mentioned skin intellectuals. Can you tell us about this type of beauty consumer? And um, so, skin intellectuals is definitely kind of a trend that's been driven by Asia. And um, we know that Asian consumers are very into skincare. They really understand the kind of intrinsic link between wellness, healthy lifestyles, and the impact that has on their skin. And so in Project Butterfly, and um, something that we found from Chinese consumers is that the number one kind of statement that they resonated with was knowing the ingredients in my facial skincare products is important to me to help me make product choices. So they are so kind of aware of ingredients and knowing what they do for their skin. Um, and the second one behind that was I believe that healthy skin makes for beautiful skin. So really kind of thinking about the health of their skincare is really kind of um, a top priority for these consumers. And then we've seen this trend then trickle across to the West. So in the US and UK, now seeing skin intellectuals really rise in prominence. 
and the people really taking kind of the cue from what we've seen in the Asian market in understanding more about skincare, more about kind of skin health and how important that is. Um, and that's why I've seen this shift kind of from the cosmetics market over to the skincare market uh, with people taking the time to really nurture and look after their skin. Um, so in Asia, we've um, for a long period of time, we've seen multi-step regimes where consumers are really kind of having that skincare wardrobe and layering skincare on top of each other so that they can get the desired result and again being able to flex their regime. Um, so Asian consumers are really ahead of the game when it comes to this and we're actually seeing kind of that trend just continue across the market now. Yeah, well, you all have glowing skin, so you must be drinking your water. You must be getting your sleep and doing the self-care. <laughs> it's <laughs> really a bit of a seven-hour flight to get to you. You know, if we'd have been on a seven-hour flight to get to you, we would have been dehydrated and wrinkled yeah. by the time we were from your life. Absolutely. But you're absolutely right. I mean, we're seeing those trends both in the U.S. and the U.K. that you, you, both, that you guys are speaking of. Um, Millie, I wanted to ask you, which of these changing behaviors do you think are going to last into the future? Oh, goodness. Um, well, I think all of it, really. I mean, the thing is, is that we aren't traveling internationally as much. Um, we probably will be wearing masks for the foreseeable future. I can't see those going anytime soon. Um, I think that access to ingredients and information is just becoming more and more um, available to people. People are understanding it more. I've got a 14 year old daughter who's regularly telling me what she needs from TikTok. So, you know, that information is just spreading um, at a rapid pace. Um, I think we've learned to sort of slow down a little bit. Maybe we'll work a little bit from home, a little bit from the office. Maybe there'll be a four day week. There's so many things that are going to change moving forward that are sort of a permanent hangover from COVID. Um, and, you know, and, and not to mention the, the ingredients, the ingredients are better. Skincare is better. People are getting better results. Um, it's almost as if um, these, these products are, giving you what a dermatologist would give you um, you know if you went to see uh, a derm for a skin condition so you can get that kind of effect now with something like retinol and 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 it's obvious and you can show the benefit of the transformation on your social media so then other people catch on to it it's you know this is this is um this sharing of information is is definitely something that will stay with us now for a long time and, and also it's really helped us because COVID has made us so isolated that I've seen such an uplift in the sharing of this information and it's almost how we're reaching out to each other to have a bond with other people. So you can go onto these Facebook groups and there are people with you know, acne scarring that are openly talking about something that really bothers them and people are responding and they're being kind and they're offering solutions and this is growing, this sort of skin trust is growing and so uh, i i just don't think that's going to go anywhere it's really given the sort of um the blogging um influencer model real purpose whereas there's a period of time when we were like is does this work is this you know are people going to believe this um you know the whole sort of hashtag ad hashtag sponsored hashtag gifted all of a sudden it, it felt a little bit thin in terms of the model, but I think that this, um, like you were saying, the skin influencer model has given this more purpose. And, and I do think this is gonna stick around for a while. Yeah. Okay, um, I wanted to switch gears to in another couple focus areas that the report had. So one big focus area in the report is the rise of technology and digital and the impact of that on the beauty industry. So. For example, the rise of artificial intelligence over the last few years, the rise of augmented reality, especially during COVID, uh, with people not being able to go into stores and try things on. Um, and along with that, the rise of digital communities and, you know, to the point that you guys have mentioned, skin influencers. The report also looks at the intersection between uh, health and beauty products and those products that work from the inside out. Um, and also talks about blockchain technology and the impact that that would have on transparency within the industry. 
So of all these topics, I wanted to kind of get into it a little bit. So Millie, we'll start with you. What trends do you, uh, what trends speak to you in particular and which are really going to take off from the ones that I just mentioned? Well, I think blockchain will be inevitable and it will be something that has to happen. Um, And I think that if you don't have transparency of supply chain, you are going to be left on the shelf because I, everyone will want to know where their products are coming from and whether that's being able to scan a QR code in store to being able to find that information online. I mean, there's an organization called Provenance, so I think do it very well. They allow the brands to upload um, their certifications um, online to their to whatever portal they're listed on and i think that that's that's going to become um it's a fait accompli i think everyone will have to have that that transparency uh i think in terms of ai i actually think personalization is going to be incredibly important i don't think we've managed to nail it yet in terms of the physical manifestation of the brand so i think there's been a lot of personalized products function of beauty um you know those kind of sort of how personalizing brand, I mean, going back to prescriptors really, but the models always become quite cumbersome and quite expensive and not very practical um, to to put into store and online. Um, And so I think that digital technology will help move personalization on because it's really the only option we've got left. We've been trying it for years and we haven't quite got it right yet. and then in terms of this sort of ingestible sort of inside outside, I think that that is um, something that will grow. I think it's a little bit slower. There's a certain age demographic, it feels like, or maybe it's even a psychographic that is more inclined to take those kind of um, the internal um, version of the skin products they put on the outside of their body. I think that's one that can is in the hanging in the balance at the moment because I think that um it's uh, you hit a certain age and that's when you want those the extra collagen and the extra elastin and you know the extra hyaluronic acid so um i think that that's going to take a little bit of time to go from the sort of over 50s and trickle down into the younger um ages but but i think that they're all here to stay i think they're just going to sort of um they're going to run at different speeds really those those variety I, I think blockchain and is probably the most obvious um and the thing that's going to really run um full speed ahead because it's a global emergency isn't it this is not a marketing concept um you know we have a planet in crisis and so actually if i had to pick one that i would put money on it would be that anyway because that's the one that needs to be backed by us all Julie, let's talk about from your standpoint, what are you seeing in terms of the impact that digital and technology will have in the way that we consume beauty going forward? I mean, for me, it's all about social media. I mean, it's like it runs my life as a journalist. I mean, if you're not on TikTok, if you're not on Instagram, if you're not looking at what's going on on Twitter, which for me as like a 30 older something, you know, TikTok, I want to like, sometimes like take a nap. I'm like, what is like, not that it's not exciting and like, right. Like not that it's not exciting and interesting because I'm in it and I'm looking, but like for me to actually like do it is like what they're like taking off their face and putting it back on and like they're splicing and dicing and one minute they've got a product in their hand and another minute they don't. It's like, some type of Houdini, like magician three that like, I do not have the bandwidth to truly participate in. However, I do think that those platforms are driving the beauty conversation, right? Like I cannot be a beauty director without understanding the conversations that are having there. You know, to everyone's point, the skin influencers. And sometimes there's bad information, you know, circulating. And it's our job as people who know what a niacinamide is and know what retinol is and like know what AHA and BHA are to say, okay, we know you saw this on TikTok, but actually you can burn your face off 
if you do it this way, you know? So, you know, I think that it, it's, um, it goes hand in hand. There's things that we want to celebrate and say, this is really great. And these are conversations that are hap happening on social media. And then sometimes we're saying, these are conversations that are happening, but beware because it's not all it's cracked up to be. And we want to make sure that you're okay. Right. So, um, you know, I think that for me is the biggest thing is the social media um, communities. Um, but, you know, the whole blockchain thing too is really important. When I talk to people about, you know, great products, a lot of times they're like, okay, well, what, where's that ingredient come from? Is this sustainable? Did, you know, is it organic? Is it that? I'm like, wow, like they want to know where, wh what, where this product came from and the the manufacturing and stuff just as much as they want to know that it'll clear up their mass knee mm -hmm. and i'm like that's incredible that's like such a conscious and thoughtful consumer is emerging from this time that we've never seen before because i think before it was it was mostly about results it was like will this clear my skin okay give it to me right now it's like well is it fair trade and like you know, can I recycle the packaging? And what's the company's footprint? And was there any people of color? Because I'm a person of color and I have hyperpigmentation. Was there a person of color developing this product? It's like, whoa, like your mind is blown. So for me, even as a journalist, I need to know that just as much as I need to know how the efficacy of the product. I need to also know the background story about that brand. So um, a lot is changing from this time um but it's 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 honestly for me and i hope for everyone else really exciting and really pushing us to be even better at our jobs yeah absolutely i mean the combination of expectation around efficacy plus the social responsibility is at its climax and for good reason so grace what about you what uh what do you believe is going to have the biggest impact and what interests you the most out of these areas um, I think a big one for me, and a, a word that I would always come back to for the next kind of few years is purpose. What is the purpose behind it? And is it a purpose-driven product? So, you know, exactly, you know, you've both just said around sustainability, around transparency, around blockchain, you know, how are we supporting that mission? Just look at some of the huge kind of um, TV programs and documentaries that have gone viral, like Seaspiracy, that everybody is talking about at the minute because it's telling us kind of the harm we are having on our oceans at the minute and what's causing that and how we can prevent that. And, you know, it's, it only takes something like that in the beauty industry or in the fashion and beauty industry to really highlight some of the issues that we're facing into. And I think, you know, as a, as a business, as a brand, as a person, we should all be thinking about, you know, how can I help that mission? How can I support that? So I would completely agree with, um, you know, what you've both said around blockchain and how that could really be an unlock to help with that. Um, and then the other piece around purpose is I think sometimes the beauty industry can get really underestimated in the power that we have in people's lives around mental health, around confidence, around how we make people feel. And I think sometimes you can say, oh, it's just a bit of makeup. But it's so much more than that. And I think, you know, when you talk to customers and you go to focus groups and you, you know, see the research that we've done. So in Project Butterfly that I mentioned earlier, that 87% of beauty consumers surveyed globally agreed that if I look good, I feel more confident. Um, and, you know, 75% of women agreed that beauty and personal care products have a positive impact on their mental well-being. So, you know, three quarters of women that that's having a positive impact. Like how amazing is that to be part of that purpose? And I think that's what for me is something that as a brand really thinking about that. And I think, you know, the number seven campaign that we did to help women back into the workplace was another one for me that I felt so proud of being part of that business and part of that company that were, that had a purpose. The purpose, you know, we didn't put pictures of products on that campaign. It was about women and helping women because that's what our brand's about. And I think for me, that is just so so important to just continue to push on and keep helping the community that we're living in. Um, and then the second piece for me is around tech. And I think it's a really interesting one around where that's going to go, how it's going to be used in beauty. You know, we've seen a lot of kind of 
playing around with it, you know, augmented reality. We've all tried the app where we try on different makeup and try on different hair colors. And, but you know, it's, they're not quite there yet. You can't quite tell if that hair color really suits you. And I think there's going to be a lot of movement in that space. And I think the, 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 the part of it that really excites me is around devices and smart devices and devices that can help us to diagnose our skin and monitor our skin and know if that product's working for us or not. Um, know if it is drying up that pig, if it is um, kind of helping that pigmentation or stopping that dryness. Um, and not just having to go off what you see, but actually the data of is it improving. And that's when I think something like ingestibles could start to take off because Whilst you can't see it, you can monitor if it is actually working. Um, you know, things like shade matching it can help us with as well. When this huge shift to online shopping that we've seen in the beauty space due to COVID, you know, issues with you know matching shades is still hard by doing it online. Um, you know, I've wanted to buy a new foundation for months, but I didn't because I just need to check the shade and make sure it will it will match. So I think you know this is where digital can really help us to push beauty and really capitalize on online because consumers have gone there um, so I think there'll be lots of exciting innovations in the tech space uh, for beauty as well great okay ladies my final question is around diversity and inclusion and what brands can and should be doing more of so Julie is change happening and is it happening fast enough change is happening and it's happening really fast. And if you're not moving as fast as the change is moving, then you will get left behind and you will suffer, I think. Um, this is a huge, you know, um, topic around the world, but definitely in the United States where I am, I'm in New York City and like, we can't not talk about this. Um, in across industries. But in beauty, it's interesting because, I mean, in this past year, obviously, it was huge, this whole push for um, Black-owned brands. And I remember in June when every all the media companies were like, okay, like, let's start buying Black-owned brands. And like, here's a roundup of 30 best, you know, Black-owned beauty brands. And, you know, I was like, that's interesting because I know at least 200. And like I sat as a black woman in at the table as a beauty director, there's not many of us, right? And it was also my job as that black woman at the table to say, let me push my industry and my colleagues a little further. And I sat there for cosmopolitan.com and did a list of 125 black owned beauty companies off the top of my head. If, but the way my time is set up, I could have gone probably 225 but I was just like, I'm letting y'all know that we can't be lazy about this. You have your roundup of 20 and 30, here's 125 just to get started, right? Like, and, and I had so many colleagues from other media brands, other magazines reach out to me and say, wow, like I was being so lazy. I was just, I wasn't paying attention to the fact that there were all, all these brands and all of these founders, because beyond it being, oh, this mascara was made by a black owned company. It's like that founder has a story that also, again, helps us as writers to then tell that story rather than just being like, here's the new Maybelline or like whatever it is, you know, um, which I think, and now there's, there's a learning curve too, because I got a lot of feedback of people saying, okay, that's really great. I love all these black owned companies. Um, and I have some black friends that I'm going to buy this for, you know, my white friends would say, and I'm like, mascara or lipstick made by a black owned company doesn't mean it needs to go on black lips or black eyelashes. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, just open your mind that this is not like that sort of thing. This is about pouring back into a community that wasn't being seen, wasn't getting the resources and investment that, you know, they were. So I'm really passionate about this topic because I do think that it's one, just good business. Like companies need to be investing in these companies and investing obviously into the consumer. Even if you don't invest in a black owned company, what is your, what is your product line like? I did a whole story um, in the in Cosmopolitan's um, October issue about 
hair wraps and hair um, scarves and hair bonnets. It's a whole beauty ritual that women of color interact with nightly. We protect our hair at night, right? I'll either, like if I have my hair straightened, I'll wrap it and put a silk scarf on it. With my hair like this, I'll put a bonnet on it or like a, a hair sock um, to protect my edges, to protect my curls. <laughs> Where are all the companies, like the mainstream companies that have products for that? It's a whole ritual that people are, are doing and they don't. And so I think that's that level of sto nuanced storytelling is also coming from this to say you weren't paying attention to, you know, the diverse consumers before, but I bet you will now because one, it's altruistic. And two, it's good business. I'm like, I didn't go to business school, but I know you don't like making money if you have a whole entire skincare line and nothing to specifically um, target hyperpigmentation, especially in dark, darker skin tones. Because it's like, you know, it's one thing to have an age spot or, you know, like something like that, but like, using the language that, you know, the diverse consumer uses and making sure that the product, the, the, the ingredient levels are right for my skin tone and not, you know, my, my white sister skin tone, you know, like those sort of nuanced, thoughtful things need to start happening because, you know, the diverse consumer, I always want to say me because I am her, we, we over index, we spend more than our white counterparts. So, yeah. you know, to me, I'm like, y'all don't like making money, but cause I'm, we're here and willing to start spending if you are thoughtful and, um, and, you know, genuine about your product development and the storytelling behind it. Yeah. And there's still a long ways to go, but I am happy to see some of the progress of major companies, especially in the retail landscape. So Ulta Beauty, for example, major beauty retailer in the U.S., putting together a $25 million investment towards advancing their DEI agenda, which includes Black-owned brands and trainings and that sort of thing. So it's good to see the progress being made. Um, Millie, with your role at the British Beauty Council in the U.K., what are you seeing in terms of a sense of urgency around this, and is it enough? Well, you know, weirdly, in 1996, I had a brand in the U.K., with a friend of mine who's a makeup artist um, and she's a woman of color. And um, it was very much our story together. So for me, I, I'm surprised that this is coming up now because it was something that we were working on. How, I don't even know how long ago that was, 25 years ago. So it has taken a long time for this to, this change to actually seriously start to happen and for an industry that is built on self-care and purpose and confidence um i find it a little frustrating that we don't have a better uh sense of belonging or a, a sort of mandate of inclusion you know whether that be the color of your skin or the texture of your hair or whether you have a, 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 a um you know, challenges with your physical ability, or there are so many different things that I think that we that we need to look at. Um, I'm glad that it's definitely um, moving quickly now. I do feel like it's been a long time coming, and I think it's quite. I'm I'm personally quite frustrated by that. Um, I also think equality is another thing that, as a woman, um, I'm very frustrated with. Um, our industry is 88% female, but um, the top 10% is still men <laughs> and they have the big jobs <laughs> and the nice corner offices. So, um, you know, there is a, there are a lot of hurdles. And I think that whilst I'm really pleased and, and pleasantly um, supportive of the sort of the dynamic and fast change we've seen over the past year or two, I do think that this has been, again, bubbling up for a very long time and people's frustration and COVID and um, George Floyd have really pushed this agenda forward. Um, and I hope that this is um, a, 
definite change for 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 the better because it's um I, I just think it's very frustrating because i think that you know we are an amazing industry for people to enter into from various different levels of education different walks of life different socioeconomic um situations and we are so welcoming and open but yet we don't often project that well enough and um and i and we can do better personally not to be too hard on ourselves but i think we we should do better really as yeah. as a as as an industry the other thing i would say is that about two years ago when we first launched the british beauty council one of the things that was very apparent is that education in hair and makeup and skin wasn't mandated in this country to be inclusive so textured hair was an add-on you know it was a module you could add on to your education your practical education and the, over the past two years we fought very hard to get that included um, as part of the curriculum and we believe that we've we've done it because in we think around end of may june it will be announced that that's part of the national occupation standards so it's things like that it's kind of like delving into what what really goes wrong behind the scenes and fix it down there it's not it's not to me fixing situations problems issues challenges is not always about the public facing piece a lot of times it's what's going on behind the scenes that makes this not work properly and the education that we were giving hairdressers um skin technicians beauty therapists makeup artists etc was not good enough so that needed to be fixed because now we can be certain that moving forward in the future we can churn out really well educated very well rounded practitioners and so i think that's you know you you have to kind of peel the layers of the onion sometimes unfortunately and have a little cry to get to the bottom of it yeah and grace what about you what are you hearing from consumers in the research you've done um i think from consumers they expect this this is no longer a nice to have or something that is nice to see it's expected you know that you have an opinion that you make a difference that you drive change you know just look at, at blm you know the brands that didn't stand out they didn't have an opinion on this were called out you know you had um pull up or shut up saying tell us how what percentage of your work workforce you know how how diverse are you and i think the brands that didn't you know have an opinion on this or weren't transparent and open were called out so i think a big thing for me is you may not be perfect but being open honest and transparent and saying you know we're facing into this it's not good enough we are changing things is the first step um and i think you know what millie said for me just hit the nail on the head of marketing and putting things on social media is one thing but actually what you do behind closed doors for me is even more important because it's all well and good to kind of say things to get the praise or get the, you know, let people know that so long as you're living and breathing that in your head office, on your social media channels, in your private emails to staff members, in your pay reviews, you know, for gender equality and everything, then there's no point in saying it externally. Like you need to live and breathe it and believe in that internally for it to really then, you know, trickle through into everything that you do as a brand. Um, and I think, you know, so 88% of consumers believe that companies have the power to influence societal change, and we do. So I think we, you know, play a hugely important role in making that change happen. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It goes back to what we were saying at the very beginning of this session around the authenticity and everything that you're doing. Mm. So, um, okay, my friends, no, we no, I'm no, sure have very... plenty more to talk about, but we're out of time. And so I just want to say once again, Julie, Millie, and Grace, thank you so much for being here with us today.